on Kilgallen, like he's another lad like Keen Prendergast, he's from Kildare, like and uh, they're all from that little Eads town area where Ty Byrne is from. Like, so I don't know what they're doing out there. There's something going on out there. Yeah. Man. Freaks. Production like, line of, yeah, yeah, great athletes, yeah. Yeah, I might have a child and set up out there. there <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Joe presents House of Rugby, together with Bank of Ireland, proud supporter of the four Irish provinces. Hello and welcome back to House of Rugby together with Bank of Ireland. I'm Greg O'Shea and as always, the lovely Lindsay Peets here with me. How are you, Lindsay? I'm good. It's brought me Top Gun look. Yeah, you're today. dressed like Tom Cruise today. <laughs> if I look like Tom Cruise, I'd be delighted. But uh, <laughs> if I look like, I'm sure we got it. I oh, you look great. If you're watching on YouTube, you'll see it. She looks great. <laughs> Tune in. Tom Cruise best. Um, Pat, you're joining us today on the mic. How are you doing, sir? Good, good, good. Yeah, uh, well, fresh. Six hours sleep, so yeah, kind of fresh face yeah, wired, that. ready to go. Uh, maybe should have got a bit of makeup done on myself or <laughs> get the bags out from under my eyes Listen, as well. Yeah, yeah. You can't improve on perfection, Patrick. <laughs> yeah. Nah, you look great, man. Because you just had a baby, what, two weeks ago? Yeah, yeah, just over two weeks ago. Yeah, a uh, little uh, Anna McCarry. Yeah, so um, she's doing good. This is my this is my one day into Dublin here. <laughs> I'm gonna be uh, have to get back maybe as soon as possible as well. And I'm just gonna be handed a baby now when I get in the front <laughs> door. So yeah, everything's going well. And and Katrina's. Um, tipping away and kind of um, just holding everything together as she normally does w- w- with an extra baby to kind of look after as well, yeah. Brilliant well, you're kind of outlining her trip now this morning. Seven kids, the baby, school trip, ice and... Yeah, yeah, yeah that's it. Um, I even just got a message from her there and she got back safely enough, but yeah, she uh, she dropped the kids and, and the next door neighbours, two little lads <laughs> who are uh, sports mad now. They're in the, in the car as well and so I don't know how she did it, but no, um, but that's I promised I'm, I'm going to be on around <laughs> to help out for the rest. We'll of check week. in next week and see how you get on. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah. Congratulations, she's absolutely little dog. So congratulations, oh, cheers, thank you. Awesome. Well, for those of you that don't know, Pat basically runs the show from behind the scenes here. He produces all the content and the briefs and everything. So without Pat, House of Rugby wouldn't be a thing. So it's great to actually have you on the mic today. Thank you. Um, and you actually had a interview with Gregory Aldrich a few weeks ago, who plays with La Rochelle and also France. He's the number eight for France. He's one of the best players in the world. World. We're going to have that interview later, um, but we're going to just catch up with the rugby news. We had European Cup just the mm-hmm. weekend gone, but even before the European Cup, we had some big news in world rugby. Two international coaches got sacked, Eddie Jones, <laughs> which came out of nowhere really, or got sped up really because he had such a bad campaign this year, and Wayne Pivak got the sack, which was kind of a foregone conclusion. Uh, that was just all? dragging on, wasn't it? Yeah. It's kind of the tale of two coaches, really. I was kind of surprised at Eddie Jones, and I know it was his worst, their worst year as regards results since 2008, and as regards in English rugby and the kingpins of the rugby world is probably not good enough for them. But, I mean, if you go back to probably, you know, he's three Six Nations, he probably pulled uh, the... Uh, a trick out of the bag that he normally does in 2019 when they upend New Zealand in the semi-final of the World Cup got to a World Cup final so he's a man who could have done he's the magician you know mm. he could have done anything in the next nine months so I was mm. kind of surprised and I think Owen Far- Farrell alluded to that in yeah, a couple yeah. of interviews over the weekend that he was really disappointed he really enjoyed his t- like his time under Eddie Jones' his tenure you forget he's there seven years yeah, so it is kind yeah. of a long time as well in in elite sport and, and the world of rugby. So it was kind of surprised to him. Poor Wayne Pivak, I was like, put him out of his misery, <laughs> to be honest. Yeah, funny enough, I actually bumped into Owen Farrell like last week in the airport. He is a man mountain. I is never, he like really? Yeah. Oh my God. Like I thought, oh, he's now half. I'd probably, probably be the same size as me, similar, yeah. maybe a little bit bigger. He could be a back row. He's a similar size to Josh van der Fleer. Stop. He is crazy. Obviously a little bit smaller, but like I couldn't believe how big he was. Yeah. And he came over, shook my hand and he like just a big paw <laughs> and like crushed my Your hand. hand disappeared. <laughs> yeah. oh, thank you for that. Yeah, so it was cool meeting him. But yeah, he had a couple of words to say about the Eddie Jones situation. And I tend to agree with him that Eddie Jones has a really good CV behind him. He got Japan to the World Cup and did really well there and and all the way along he's been a great coach and nine months out from a World Cup I think it's just crazy to be sacking mm. a head coach like it's just going to cause such stress and such pressure on the new guy coming in what do you make of it Pat? Yeah like I, I kind of it's very there's, there's actually I was going to say parallels there's no parallels what's happening with Gareth Southgate in England at the moment where like you know he got them to a final as well but then just been tough times bad performances like they've only got to the quarter final there I was, it's the, but the reaction over like all the English media are very positive about him hardly any criticism and I think it's almost because he 
gets on with the media and if you get on with the media and you give them nice stories and you and you're a nice guy which by all accounts he is like that it really does you know do you a lot of favors whereas eddie jones just from the moment he came in he was just kind of firing shots at people and yeah. flinging grenades left right and center so <laughs> yeah. you can tell the, the press over there and you know from known i know a good few of them as well they just don't like him at all and it was like the minute things start turning on you they're going to turn on them then as well like so um yeah like as I, I, my only thing i was saying to somebody else about this it was like like Martin O'Neill wasn't that well loved here as a coach and it, you know in that mm. kind of stint that he had near the end and but over in England everybody thought well he's doing well with this set of players like that but in Ireland we were like no but the style <laughs> they're playing is terrible yeah. and I think this is the same thing with Eddie Jones like looking at it from afar I would think no he's doing a great job like you know got him to a final uh, he's like an expert in getting teams up for the occasion has three six nations with England as mm -hmm. well but in England they just don't like him and, and the fact that the all of a sudden they weren't selling out Twickenham anymore like you know it, yeah. it was a big thing and, and that, that style of play that people like they were, they were, so like the writing was on the wall but the media were against them as well and then that just the, the, you know it just builds and builds and yeah. the way they spoke about him like it was almost that oh he has to go and mm. I was like, it's, it's strange I would have thought definitely keep him on as you were saying for the World Cup Yeah, I think so because if you look at it right there like 4th February is not too far away I mean we're not two weeks out from Christmas really then we'll kick into Six Nations that's the excitement post Christmas so they play uh, Scotland and Twicken on, on the 4th February you five Six Nations game probably again like Ireland three test matches and you're going into a World Cup so I mean whoever takes over is under the pressure in such a small time frame and like you said I think media pressure you're not selling out England and mm. the fans have turned on you I think there's only going to be one option for you so whoever comes in a bit like now Wayne Pivak really was probably set up to fail you know after um, Warren Gatland is that going to be the same for whoever takes over Nettie Jones because are they going to bring in the same style like Pivak was quick he you know had this style with Scarlets that was exciting and quick and but it was totally in, in contrast to what you know Warren Gatland had yeah. so again you want to be recruiting somebody who's going to build on what Eddie Jones did and going to suit the style of players that you have there you know mm. so there's a lot of kind of moving parts to even get them ready for a World Cup yeah. you know I thought it was a bit harsh sacking Eddie Jones I think he was pulling it all together he was trying people in different places mm. and the players seemed to back him they seemed to like what he was which building which is a key thing which is we know key. that so I think we got some insight in there off Pat that if you lose the media you're going to lose your job so yeah. keep the media on, on your <laughs> side. Help, yeah. Yeah. Hold on, I hold Pat's hand here. <laughs> <laughs> um, but well, yeah, the Wayne Pivak thing, I think getting Gatland in there makes sense because Wayne Pivak would just was, they just weren't performing. But I thought England were kind of pulling it together. And you know, Lindsay, you played international rugby for how many years? That the ethos of a team, it's going to be hard to fix that and change that and get a new coach's mindset instilled into the team in a couple of months before Six Nations and a World Cup. There's not much they can change in that period no. of time. No, and especially if like Owens Farrell alluded to the fact that like the players liked Eddie Jones mm. and they mm. liked his style of play and they, you know, when you're a player under a coach and there's a, you know, a culture and a good setup and you're thriving and you're confident and you're enjoying the style of play and it suits you, like how is he now going to, You've now to come in, change your style of play, it, put your blueprint on it, and try and get the players on side. Win over the dressing room. Ah, as well, come on. Like, yeah. yeah, that's a big, big job. So, whoever goes to the England, do you know what? Rog Dodge a bullet. <laughs> Rog <Rodge laughs> Dodge a bullet. Good, good choice, <laughs> yeah. my friend. You know, you're a smart man. But look, one in four, like you said it there. It, why would you not use the autumn series, which they did? They only won one and four. Grant, but it highlighted so many work ons for him. And what better man than Eddie Johnson is like, don't worry, mates, we got this. And he just like, you know, rub it all out when we start again. Yeah. Like, he's the man for it, but I don't know who's going to come in now. You yeah, know, well, we were speaking of that. Um, at the moment, Richard Cockrell is the interim manager, I think, or that's a very soccer term I use there, but you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And Steve Bortwick is, the chats is that he's going to come in and take it, but he's busy with Leicester at the moment. Yeah, yeah. And Leicester in the European Cup, and Steve Bortwick keeps putting it on the long finger, he doesn't want to know about it. Yeah. He keeps going with this media answer, next game mentality, I'm not thinking about the England game. So it's looking like he's going to be the one coming in, but do you want that job that close to a Six Nations, Pat? What do you yeah, think? it's like... Um, and it's like it's it wasn't that's what even somebody said remember the initial plan with Eddie Jones was supposed to he was going to stay on for the World Cup and then like he was going to bet in his replacement yes. as well and and then he kind of got extended to the World Cup as well and so it's like whatever plans they had like I think over in England they're going crazy because like Stuart Lancaster is off to yeah. uh, you know Racing and like haven't done so well with Leinster and they're like we're just letting this guy go and um, but know, would you go back after they just kind of yeah if yeah. you were Stuart Lancaster I wouldn't go back after no, the, how they treated him again yeah like he would talk about like the the media there like he was kind of a broken man almost after mm. it like and mm. kind of had to com almost like take a complete break for a year like from it so uh, yeah and Bortwick kind of like again on the back of like 
he's got potential, but like you're just handing him. He's very young though, isn't he? Yeah. As regards a coaching role, you know, he's done a great job with Leicester and he's, you know, you remember the days he used to play in an England jersey himself. But I think, you know, no more than Rog, you know, it has to suit your family. It has to suit your CV. You have to kind of weigh it up overall. Mm. And I'm not sure then it's, it's. If I was Steve Bortwick, I'd be saying to the RFU, I'll take the job after the World Cup. Yes, and I I'll build it right. for the next four years. Yeah. So it gives him a bit of buffer room because even if he does take it now, people are going to be like, all right, let's see how we get on in the World Cup. And if England don't perform, he'll get the chop then as well. And That's he's lost <laughs> his Leicester job and his England job. Exactly. You so heard it here, Steve. Listen to us. We guided Raj. Yeah. <laughs> we'll guide you. Yeah. Well, we'll see how all that plays out. Um, but let's talk about the Racing and Leinster game. So before we even get into the actual game itself, Leinster won 42-10 after a nightmare of a travel Yeah travel day so they got delayed in Dublin airport with loads of other people for five hours and then they had to change airport and they ended up getting taxis from the other airport to the the um, stadium Le Havre or how Le Havre yeah, Le Havre yeah. which was ridiculous like imagine that as prep Lindsay like you're not getting your captains run in you're not eating right you're not drinking right you're sitting on chairs sitting in taxis and then you have to go out and play one of the best teams in the world and they did and they beat them 42 <laughs> 10 that's the thing. It's the mentality of a team. That happened to us with the Barbarians, right? Our bus didn't show up, so we all had to get... Whoever was living in England had to get us, like, Ubers, or yeah, is that yeah. what they call them over there? Yeah. So we're there going to Twickenham, and, like, I was in with Anna, Anna Kaplis and um, one of the Canadian girls, and I'm, like, you know, we're, like, waving out the window. And what else can you do? And then, obviously, the men's was cancelled because they had COVID, so we were now the stars of the show. So you can't... You kind of just have to take it in their stride. And that's exactly what kind of Leinster did. It didn't it kind of phase them whatsoever. Like, and they scored one of the tries of the weekend. Mm. Like, they just, again, knew their detail. They stuck to it. They were, they're kind of men who just were nearly liberated by all the kind of drama that, you know, preceded the game. And yeah. that's what it seemed to me. They were absolutely a joy to watch. And we'll go on about um, Ulster's performance with the kind of same dra dramatic issues with travel. But, you know, they did not, <laughs> did not show yeah. up at all. They were still left in the airport. And well, I'm actually in awe of Leinster's performance based off the back of that travel day. Like I, I've Ridiculous. been all over the world with sevens and fifteens and stuff. And like your prep is essential mm. for you playing well. Obviously, because we saw Ulster got a bait. And, but it just shows how good Leinster are and their mindset and just how rigid they are in their game plan and I'm just like scared now how are they going to get beaten like if they're going out and beating Racing 92 42 10 after that day I just think they're they're even better than I thought they were in my mind but you now. also know as a player you probably wouldn't start your prep a, a day or two before you're kind of prepping all week for this big yeah. game so I'd say again probably the undertone of it was all just slowly building towards the game so I'd say they went in thinking right we're grand and I do I'd be like you oh my god did I wear the right underwear well not saying yeah, you do yeah. I used to be like did I wear the right underwear or where's my pre-match meal and little things yeah. would have thrown me especially in the start of my career but I think just yeah they're prep going into that game and I'd say they were so confident in everything every detail I'd say they just were like right plan B lads we're just going to watch a bit of video they probably had loads of grub with them like you know we'd all travel with that so you were just yeah. I'd say they were just prepped they were it's just galvanised them it's a big tip of the hat to the backroom staff in Leinster big time yeah, d mm. for keeping those guys in playing form because I was like, oh, they could get a few injuries now. Fellas sitting in taxis for a couple of hours, tightening Two up hamstrings. Two and a half hours. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's like nearly like 180 kilometers away or something like that. Like, wow. so I was just thinking, yeah, the taxi driver is a massive winner. <laughs> we can <laughs> just like, just like the Parisian taxi <laughs> yeah, men yeah, fl yeah. flaunting the cash. I was just, yeah, just sitting there like having a, I was being stereotypical here, having a fag sitting outside the kind of like the, the stadium there or like the airport and you're like, yeah. your pickup is just four big rugby lads. So yeah. it's like, yeah, oh, yeah, that'll be. 300 quid or whatever it was like yeah and probably <laughs> smugly sitting there going right we're winning financially and we're probably now this is not going to suit like our Irish you know get, yeah. you know yeah. opposition you know so they're probably smugly sitting there for many reasons like yeah. the French have it yeah. you know it's a brilliant story well done Leinster but to talk about the actual game how good was that guy ring us try oh it's unbelievable wasn't it Lindsay yeah it was like uh Again, even it's just it's one of those ones where it's as good when you're watching, but then the replays even show it up even more, don't they? Mm. Like all Big the lines time. lads were running. I don't know whether I can use this word. We we may bleep it out in the edit, but it was genuinely rugby porn. It was ridiculous <laughs> because a I looked at it as a fan the first time. Like you said, the replay, I heard the boys like whooping, like you know when you do one of those train and pitch moves, like in your captain's run, and it comes off, and you're like, grand, it's no opposition. But when you do it when there's opposition, they were like, yes, like that worked. It was sublime the speed of pass the running lines were perfect it was off obviously set piece mm. like everything 
went to plan and mm. it was just um, even James Lowe welcome back my friend yes. I'll just have a little Kobe Bryant pass here <laughs> and do you know like even for Ring Rose to catch that and then finish with two men hanging off him it was just unbelievable Incredible. everyone ran, ran their lines perfectly and to see James Lowe as you mentioned there back in yeah. fine form and he wasn't like figuring himself out he had a great game didn't he Pat yeah like it was just kind of was was it maybe Louis or we were talking about this a couple of weeks ago or one of the lads said they saw James Lowe and they, they were saying that he needs to, he was saying to himself I need to get back because he would have saw what happened I in November I spoke to him at yeah. the Australia game we were yeah. doing a kind of pre-match uh, chats and like he's another fella I'm like you're huge for a winger <laughs> yeah but very positive and like he said like oh you know I'm disappointed to be missing you know I'm missing chances here so yeah he's a guy who was kind yeah. of yeah, he was like, in, like so he knows, like he would have seen like Jimmy O'Brien coming back and, and even Balakoon getting a try when he played mm -hmm. and, and he was said, I need to kind of, God, like, yeah, like you wouldn't think that he'd been out for like, you know, he's rusty as well, like, and his kicking was great and yeah. kind of like showed up as well in defense a few times and it was just almost like he hadn't been away and mm -hmm. like Hugo Keenan, I thought it was the same, you know, as yeah. well, like just those two lads are just kind of, yeah, har hardly played much rugby, but now all of a sudden they're kind of, you know, going to be tearing into 20 you know 2023 like and yeah. um so yeah a good few good players but yeah they, they stood out in the back line for me and um and then Kaylin Doris I thought was unbelievable like uh, I was I said sometimes I'll, I'll watch a game and if you're writing a story or something yeah. I'll sometimes you can pick in the first half where you think a player has stood out so I was watching that I was like I'm going to do something with Kaylin Doris he's had a yeah. great game and then I always hate then like at the end he got man of the match I was like oh, feck, everyone uh, else has yeah. seen it now as well like now it looks like I'm making the most surprise. obvious point in yeah. the world like, yeah. yeah I got man of the match yeah, I thought Porter did well now in the front row I think he was mobile yeah. like he was central to that um, he obviously got the first try and then I think did he carry off a line out for the um, second try in the corner with uh, what's his name the hooker Oh, what is it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, sorry, Don Sheehan. Yeah, uh, with skip pass from uh, Gibson Park. So I thought he was mobile and even. Do you know what I loved about Leinster actually? Didn't they rob? Was it a South African at uh, uh, tip and go? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think it was the Bulls. Yeah, Bulls. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And I thought it was fantastic because again, like it went to the TMO and he's like, "Now nah, it's just a lovely kind of mobile try." You know, that wasn't the word he used, but it was kind of it. dynamic. That was it, yeah. and it was. It was like, do you know, they just bamboozled wrestling because. I've been there the five meter and you're like, oh God, here I go, right? Take a deep breath because you're going to be absolutely smashed. Yeah. You know what I mean? Whereas there was just, everything was fresh and they kind of done their homework. And again, everything just, everyone knew their role. You know? Yeah, it was incredible. And I also think we need to give a shout out to how good Ross Byrne was without Johnny Sexton being there. Mm. It seemed like they didn't need Johnny at all, wasn't it? Ross played very well. Yeah, very well. yeah, it was great. It wasn't it to see him back like in, um, our very own Jason Hennessy. He was over there. He had an easier travel over there. They must have, he must have got the earlier flight and, and he was <laughs> over there and he was out celebrating the, the England-France football game <laughs> then as well. And But uh, he was he was only talking about, um, you know, just how good Ross Byrne was and kind of like... An, yeah, it's almost like th they didn't miss a beat. And no. and like that was the whole thing with Ireland. You're always hoping to see Leinster don't seem to mind as much when Sexton's not around because Ross Byrne plays so well. And he steps up in loads of big European games for them. And his but, kicking is an exception yeah. as well. Yeah. But we hadn't seen it for Ireland now. Like, but like hopefully maybe the bit of confidence that he has, you might so see him. So how do we involved. integrate him though? Yeah. How do we integrate him in turn? Because I'm the same opinion you when I was watching him, I was like, he didn't look you know, he looked basically that he just stepped into Johnny's shoes. He might as well just, you know, he's his understudy. And there was like everything on the game line, his time in a pass. And which is hard because Johnny just puts everyone in on that game line. And I think that's the big difference. And obviously his game management. But how do we integrate Ross Byrne after coming on just in Australia? You know, yeah. come on from your couch, grab your Nikes, finish the game for us. How do we get him into an Ireland jersey with the same confidence? Yeah. Does he just have to play? Yeah, it kind of is that it is that confidence thing I think with him as well, isn't mm -hmm. it? It's like and the other lads need to back him as well. Like, yeah, how does he do that with Sexton still being around and, and the guy who clearly calls the shots and is the kind of like the emotional leader of the team, then how do you step in and mm. it's still gonna be tough to do, isn't it? But like um yeah, it you know, again with Crowley kind of will he kick on Carberry had a decent game at the weekend as well, but like is Byrne I think he'll definitely be involved in the Six Nations squad. Hopefully. Like and then is he the guy, is he the kind of the, almost if you can say to him for the next while, you're the finisher now, you're the guy, mm -hmm. you've, you've finished the game out for us, you've won a game for us, do it again. Like, and so that's your role now and then step into it. And then the lads might trust him, especially if he's knocking over game winners as well. Like, so yeah, we we hadn't really seen him with Ireland before. And that's why he even spoke himself when he said that's how proud he was. And that was his best ever Ireland outing as well. Mm -hmm. Like, so hopefully it means a lot to him. It, it will be interesting. I think they're playing this Friday against um, Gloucester now. Gloucester, yeah. Does he start Half again? Eight, I yeah. Think. Big late one. Yeah. Yeah. I think, from, in my opinion, I think Ross Byrne is the most reliable out of all those 10s you named there as mm. a second choice. I 
like I see Ross Brown come onto the pitch, I'm like, he's not going to make any mistakes. He might not light up the world, but he's going to hit all his passes, make all his tackles, make all his kicks. And that's what you need in a 10. Mm. Where with Joey and, and Jack Crowley, they're class players. But you're a bit like, oh, is he going to get this kick? Oh, what's he going to do now? Mm. Where Ross just does his job every time, which is probably what you're saying there would be an unbelie- unreal finisher yeah, for yeah. the Irish team. So well done, Ross. Keep it up. It's a great time as well to be stepping up with yeah. only a couple of weeks before the Six Nations and World Cup. Like yeah, They're pinning so. down these players. So uh, well done, Ross. We're proud of you. Next game, Tom- Toman Park. I could barely see it, lads. I was standing in, <laughs> I was in the stand and I could barely see the game. The fog came in like crazy. I'm actually surprised the game went ahead after halftime um, but Munster unfortunately lost 18-13 I presume you, you caught it Lindsay I did, did you? yeah what did you make of it? Um, do you know what they started really well they started really really well um, but I think their game management and the style like it was basic basic errors you're just not going to get away against Toulouse like uh, Jack Crowley obviously we spoke about there come on mm. as centre uh, Joey was playing well and Jack O'Donovan come on which I was surprised he didn't start but obviously that's just the you know Gavin Coombs is back kind of firing um, and they both kind of had carries when they, like, I don't know whether it was lads being tired and not clearing their, like, Toulouse just targeted the monster breakdown. And, like, they got poor turnovers in the 22. I mean, you're only going to get so many opportunities to be in Toulouse's 22 to score. And they just made some basic errors. I thought Mike Haley was standout now in the mm. first half. I thought he's absolutely exceptional on the high ball. Um, his running lines, his defence. Um, Anton Frisch probably didn't have the same impact we've seen him in the last couple of weeks. Um, but there were so many glimpses, like Craig Casey again, they scored two tries against Edinburgh when they went kind of blindside. He went again when they scored for Joey's try. So there's glimpses of all the stuff they've been doing well over the last couple of weeks. But I think game management and turnover in front of the post for Toulouse to score, you know, it's you just can't make those mistakes in European rugby, um, especially against the big teams, you know. And I know the weather conditions weren't great, but I was like, do you know what? To- Full time in park, you know, European Cup rugby, is some young guns playing confidence is back I thought really Munster would would shade it to be honest but yeah what do you think of it Pat yeah like it was that's it like that first 20 minutes you're thinking this could be one of these kind of like the classic Munster kind of you know winter mm. you know European Cup performances and and I thought like, who's it John Hodden it like yeah he'd break in I get, yeah you're wondering like because Jack O'Donoghue who's like just he's such a solid performer for them he's almost like Ross Byrne in a way like does well for the province doesn't get a look in really mm. with Ireland but yeah, surprised not to see him there because like he normally does well. And then Hodden it all of a sudden you were like, I suppose Roundtree was rewarding him for the work he's been doing in the yeah. background as well. And even that game against South Africa A, like it's like here's your chance, you've taken it, go start a big European game, and and he started well. And then they just kind of yeah they fell away or else T- Toulouse kind of figured him out a little bit. And as you said, like just went after him at the breakdown mm-hmm. and and just made it messy, you know, like and yeah. And then like in those kind of conditions, um, yeah, like Haley was kind of one of the only kind of you know, bright sparks for them as well. I thought Carberry actually Carberry had a good did game, very well like, yeah. actually. Yeah. But um yeah, a lot of stuff then it didn't kinda of click or else they'd they just couldn't string the phases together. Like they'd get like you know five or six and then something would go wrong or they'd yeah. get knocked back or something like that. So um really fell away and um yeah just kind of and then DuPont with his kind of new kind of like and his yellow new curve beard. For, yeah. yeah, like you know, <laughs> and kind of like beard. looking great. Like his new shading. They they just kind of seem to kind of get get the, the run of them then as well. And then yeah Frisch who he, he kinda He's been almost a surprise package in a way that he's done well, came in to start like Fekatoa was the big sign mm-hmm. and then Frisch came in and, and then I, I saw like I was watching it on, on RT and Jamie Heaslip was kind of highlighting him for jumping out of the line and you know He kind of bit in for that first try, didn't he? Now yeah. I was like, right, so you're a back. Tell us what we do there because to me, right, he bit in but he no one. So the full back obviously Haley had come in. So I don't know whether it was full back's position to kind of come round the winger or else push in in between the winger and you know what I'm saying? Because he kind of bit in, but there was no one. Because mm. you, if you make that decision, I assume you need to take man and ball and make sure that ball does not go. But sure, then um, LaBelle scored in the, in the wing and a very good finish. But it was kind of, to me, it was just time and was wrong in position. Yeah, well, for, for me in that sense, I, I saw it when it happened. I was like, why did he shoot in there? And if you're going to shoot, either everyone has to shoot. Yes. It has to be a decision beforehand that we're all going to shoot and close the space. Or if you're going to, you, you have to hit it. If you're going to jump out of line, you must hit the ball or it's just a terrible decision. Mm. And it was just kind of a lack of communication because the two glads seemed to drop in under Frisch then and they just couldn't get out to LaBelle. But for, for the game overall, I was I was standing there watching it and I was just thinking, Toulouse weren't doing too much to win it. It's just Munster kept making mistakes. In yes. at the side, Frisch threw a ball behind the winger at one stage. Like they were ma- giving away penalties, getting caught. And I was like, they're just giving the game to Toulouse here. And Toulouse just didn't make any mistakes, made their kicks, took their opportunities and just won the game. Obviously, mm-hmm. Anton Dupont was just next level again. He's just, he's just the best player. 
ever. He just like what stood out for me was when say uh, Toulouse caught it in the twenty two and they were clearing their lines and he couldn't kick off his right foot, so he just turns, goes onto his left foot and just box kicks <laughs> it over the halfway line yeah. and just strolls up just casually. Next thing out, spri- uh, dummies a pass, sends Jeremy Lockman into the stand, goes through, runs around Haley. And I'm like, is there anything Anton Dupont can yeah, do? Yeah, nice break. Yeah, he's in just incredible. Half. Obviously, Haley had a great game, but Dupont went around him two or three times and caught him two or three times as well. So. I think he was a massive element of it and then get the yellow card and still get man of the match. Well, I, I, that was the thing, right? I think it was post-match time thing with Jamie Heaslip and um, Eddie O'Sullivan. They were kind of just saying, you know, it was cynical, but he knew what he was doing, do you know, because there would have been a break on the mm. line. So he was like, now, mind you, they were still like in Monsters 22. Do you know, it wasn't like, it was a good penalty to give away and yellow card, but he still could have put his team, like, I mean, he's the nine, he's central, he was central to their performance and he was yeah. just like, oh, I'll see you lads. And that was the <laughs> thing in his post-match was he was like, sorry, to, I did a bad thing. I put my team under pressure, but thankfully, it, you know, nothing happened. So yeah, cheers, he's man. The so match had walked off. So chill. Like, he just went in and got an early shower. Cause it was, oh yeah, he was freezing. <laughs> it was freezing in Thomond Park, lads. Honestly, like, they were, fair play to the lads. They're tough out. I thought the Toulouse ads coming in that they wouldn't like the cold Limerick, like horrible. That's weather. what I was thinking. And they were grand, like they weren't even. Budging. I think Toulouse as well because the 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 weight they carry. Like there was a couple of harsh scrum penalties yeah, I thought think, against yeah. Munster, um, and Munster started well with some scrum penalties, and I thought, you know what, this is doing well. Like John Ryan is actually nearly reinvigorated since his return from Moss. So I thought he had a great game. Then we obviously had the replacements and some of the um, Dermot, um, Baron came on, uh, Roman Salanoa, um, and then uh, Josh Richley. Uh, so they come on and that's the next generation. So they didn't do too badly, but I just thought the referee was a bit pernickety and he was just a bit harsh. And as a loose head, I was saying this to Pat before we come on, um, sometimes like it was the Toulouse tie head dropped that scrum and the penalty went for him and I was like again if you're not trying to keep your bind and I thought Lachman couldn't have done any more you know because you're underneath the tie head so I was like you're just going on this elbow shape you know and sometimes I think they got Toulouse got the rub of the green but I think I'll finish in this Graham Roundtree was lovely I thought in his postmaster interview he's trying to do something with Munster he's trying to play this more expansive quick style but he kind of said, we made mistakes and we can't do it all the time. And I think that's the only thing that let Munster down was the game management. At times, they probably should have slowed it down and just kept the ball when they needed it. And then to me, when they took their penalty to kind of put them within a unconverted try to level it, I was like, would I have gone to the corner? Possibly me not being the nine or ten. I would have went to the corner to just, you know, if you're going to lose, you're going to lose. You still would have lost probably within a bonus point. But... Look, I think, you know, there's great days to come, but I think if they can learn from the management side of, of the weekend, they'll go for it. Yeah, and Pat, what do you think about Munster going up against Northampton Saints now next weekend? They'll probably have to get a win today. Yeah, yeah, and, and like the only kind of thing there to kind of keep them going is that Northampton Saints got absolutely buried by La Rochelle at the weekend. I think it was like 46, 46, 46 12, 12, something like yeah, that. Like, yeah, and um, so... Again, like, we, we'll talk about Ulster in a little bit, but the fact that you get so badly beaten, that nearly knocks you out like mm. in the first game like because your points difference is going to be so bad like and and again you're going to have to go away again like and it, like so it's it's they're on the back foot so yeah you'd i wouldn't write Munster off yet they did get like you know within they got the, the bonus point as well but yeah then they'll have to go to Toulouse and get something out of that yeah. then as well and um you actually I, I i only saw there you mentioned john ryan and how well he's done since he got back i saw i think it was the irish examiner reporting that exeter chiefs are now looking for him like so it's a shame they lost him in the first place and now it looks like they might lose him again. Like so oh I don't know how they can't find, you know, room in the budget to, to keep yeah. him around. Yeah, he's sign him up like yeah, since yeah. he's moved back, he's nearly started every game. He's yeah. been playing incredibly. I don't know why he left in the first place. <laughs> no. so. It must be a money thing though. Yeah. Just pay the man what he wants. Get a private investor in, like, because <laughs> <laughs> I know he'll want to be in Limerick because he has an Irish family and stuff, like so. And a young family, I thought. And a young me. family, yeah. so that's figure it out. Keep John Ryan here. We're not losing him again. Yeah. You mentioned the Ulster game a couple of times there, guys. So they lost 39-0 away to Sale. Like, that is just, honestly, a cricket score. They had some travel woes as well, and I was going to give them sympathy until I learned about the Leinster travel woes. Mm-hmm. So Ulster, you've no excuses, lads, really, to be honest. But we'll tell people what happened. The travel chaos with all the frost in Ireland, um, they had to end up flying to two different airports. They were initially supposed to go to Manchester, but they had to go elsewhere. Team separated and they only arrived an hour before kickoff, which obviously isn't ideal. But I don't think it's an excuse to lose 39-0, Lindsay. What do you think? No, not at that level. And like the team they had out, like I, I watched the game and they just had nothing. 
Like mm. there was nothing. They allowed their breakdown to be targeted. Sail sharks, I don't think, like the score would kind of elude. Like they were, they were clinical and they were ruthless. But I don't think they were fantastic either. Like there was, you know, it really summed up Ulster's day when they went for a, a, ki- a quick um, throw and yeah. like turned it over. And like it was just abysmal. It was yeah. just abysmal, to be honest. It, it was like... Um, I think after the game, Dan McFarren was telling people not to panic and don't worry as well. But like, God, there was like, there was nothing almost to hang your hat on. No. Like, you know, you, you hear about teams saying like, we haven't sh- fired a shot at all. Like, I, like, I can't even remember them being in the sale 22 for a, a extended period of time. Like it was, it was just a really off kind of performance and, and sale were just kind of like quick, you know, like yeah. they, they had a little scrum half, um, but they're always kind of little, aren't they? The uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah the, well, the previous to 10, I oh, think yeah, his sorry. name was a uh, little kind of waft the blonde hair and I'm having a look at it. Fergus Wire was his name. Like, that and, was it, yeah. And he had a nice, I think, 50-22 at one stage and was roughing up Nathan Doak. And yeah. just they had that speed of game. And Ulster was like, yeah. It was almost like they just... They were in know, a like, huff, do you know that? Yeah. They just seemed like they were in a huff and they were like, nah, just, I don't want to play. We've had, like, bad travel. And, you know, they were kind of nearly petulant about it. Like, like they'd Vermeulen, they'd McCluskey, they'd um, Kieran Threadwell, they'd Nathan Joke, yeah. Billy Burns. I mean, they had a they full had a squad. Full team, yeah, Lowry, Nick Timney, did everyone playing? Everyone, yeah. and not one lad stood up and even you know threw a punch. It yeah. was absolutely, it was, it was infuriating kind to watch. And I think Rory Best was commentating mm. on the channel I was watching on Rugby Pass, and he said like uh, the commentator was bringing up, "Oh, when's the last time you ne- you didn't score in Europe?" And like Rory Best was playing, you know, like this seemed like at the start of his career, and I was like, "That's saying it all now." That's you know an Ulster team who's had again some great European days, like other provinces, but you didn't even put up a score, not even a penalty. Yeah, <laughs> you know it was. Yeah, I'm very sorry, but it was disappointing. I'm so so. gonna just say that the the travel just sapped it out of their legs. It didn't have the energy. Didn't have the maybe they didn't carb load properly. Didn't but like it's not it's not an excuse. But I'm just trying to figure out because they've had such a good season up until they played Leinster what two weeks ago. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. and they lost Leinster, and now they had this poor performance in Europe. I think they're still sitting second in the URC, so the all's not lost. Yeah, yeah. But they have to go away now, and I think they have, who do they have to play? Yeah, La Rochelle, La Rochelle, La Rochelle, La Rochelle but, Saturday, yeah, 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 which is just not <laughs> ideal. Like because no. Raj had a great win last week weekend with them and they want to go play La Rochelle back to back they have to win both games really to kind of stay in the competition plan. Yeah. is that right yeah like so so that's it yeah like La, La Rochelle and, and then you absolutely like as we were talking about just annihilated Northampton at the weekend and then they'll know now that Ulster are kind of wounded like you know whatever mm-hmm. it's, you know teams often plan like your like the bones of your 15 two or three weeks in advance yeah. so like La Rochelle might they might have even been planning on resting a couple of guys but now they'll know that Ulster are like wounded like so they might just go heavy at them now and, and try and knock them out completely. Like, yeah, and big time. So that's that's going to be a great game like in, in uh, up at the Kingspan Stadium this Saturday, I think. So, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if, if La Rochelle go with it like a full pack and, and just try and... Win it outright early, get, you know, yeah. an early lead on things. And, and then that, right. that, that, all of a sudden when the, the back-to-back has to be played out then as well, then that they're, they're out of the mix. And, you know, Ulster then could then... They might just have to focus on the, the URC after that. So it, it's funny when you get that badly beaten, it really just kind of knocks the stuffing out of you. So, mm. um, yeah, and it's such a positive season up until it's amazing what two games can do for you, isn't yeah. it? Like, and how the, the momentum can get sucked that quickly out of you. Like, and I was watching it, yeah, I think you were saying Rory Best was there, it was on BT Sport, yes. I think I was watching it. And, and uh, there was a journalist, Kieran Donahue, actually, uh, who covered him a lot, Ulster. He actually said, I think it's the first time they've ever been kept to zero in Europe, like, you know, which wow. is. A, which is crazy, like, and but I was watching it, and they just they kept scoring tries near the end, and you would say like, well, that's the the bow has been put on this, or yeah. that's the cherry on top, and I think there was like three of them in the last ten minutes, and we're like, Ulster just completely like, and I would say they could have been fifty, like, you know, they're yeah. that bad, like, and yeah. fifty from their own mistakes, like Sale as said, yeah, I think it was what twenty one, then it went to twenty six, and I was like, all oh, right, still not bad, and then yeah, again they just kind of went, just spiraled even further down by the eighty yeah. minute. I think it was all summed up in when Mike Lowry threw that long pass, yeah. quick throw in, quick and it just landed on the ground and Sale picked it up and ran in. I was like, I've been watching an under 10s thing here. Like, what's going on? Someone like Mike Lowry to do that. Maybe no one was on his level. He was trying to get something going, but very weird out of Ulster. So, guys, just shake it off. I would say, don't even bother yeah, reviewing do it. Do a Taylor Swift, shake it <laughs> just off. Just shake it off, <laughs> move on. No review, yeah. No yeah. review. <laughs> don't bother because it was horrific, all right? Maybe uh, a few beers, I think. Do you yeah. know one of those <laughs> nights where you're like, lads, there's actually no answer to yeah. that performance. No few point, beers, like. just shake it off. Yeah, well, they have the personnel up there to turn it around. Yeah. You named a couple of them earlier. So I think they'll be all right because they have La Rochelle coming. 
to um to play them mm -hmm. and La Rochelle are in flying form. They beat Northampton 46-12, as you said. And Pat, you spoke to the captain of La Rochelle a few weeks ago, Gregory Aldrit, as part of the Rugby Joes a season with series. So have a look at this. It's a tough question because I don't feel like a rivality. I always like to play against uh, Ireland because they're a great team. It's always a, a massive game for us. Mm. Uh, it's a massive test match. And uh, we play rugby to play some big game like this. So I think Ireland, of course, became uh, one of the biggest uh, rugby nation in the world. And um, I think all the glory they have, all the bright they have, they deserve it, really. So it's not a rivality. Like, mm -hmm. uh, sometimes it's challenging. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, it's always good. Uh, we need challenge in the, in the rugby, but I don't feel a rivality between uh, Ireland and France, no. Who is like, um, this is one of rugby players often get thrown at them as well, but who is like maybe one of your toughest opponents that you've ever gone up against? Like it could be at, at any age level, like somebody that always kind of gives you a tough time. Um, ah, it's tough because I know some teams are terrible to play. Mm. I don't really find a player, but I think it would be a worse player for sure. <laughs> they're terrible to play, they are... You see, they never lost, lost a game for more than five points difference, so it's really... Uh, uh, it's not often, so... For sure, I wish, uh, I wish game. Yeah, yeah. Um, for you, like, you know, like, um, being here, setting, as you said, there's 12 new players during the year, like, what's what's the kind of big message you're trying to get across to somebody? Like, it's, a, like, the team culture here, and, you know, is it kind of a bit like a family? Like, you know, like, uh, everybody has each other's backs, and you know, looks out for each other. Like, what's the kind of big message you can try and get somebody up to up to speed with uh, as soon as they could when they come into the club? I think the best message uh, for the team is to watch uh, the video of uh, of last year uh, on the Arbor, mm. when we get more than 30,000 30, people on the Arbor for us. Mm. And of course, what we said at the start of the season, it's a new season, it's a new history. We're going to create our history. We don't want to stay on what happened uh, on the past. But just watch this video, watch the stadium full at every home game. And uh, hope you, everybody will feel that we are really playing for a town, for a region. And we're not playing for one person putting money on the team. Mm. And this for me is uh, most important. Have you seen a change like in the last few years with like the success of your club that more and more people are getting into the rugby team and know more about it as well in the, in the last three or four years? Of course, of course, the club is increasing, it's growing and uh, Rogers well uh, brought us uh, this winning uh, identity as well mm. because it's terribly terrible, he's a terrible competitor, he always wants to win, he does not accept to the uh, defeat. So, uh, he did a big job, and all the as well because we uh, all the players are really important, but all the people uh, doing for the administration and everything they are doing a huge uh, job as well with uh, all the the um, everything happening around the around the stadium on the on the game day. And, uh, yeah, so, so as well, they did a, they're doing a, a big job for us. Everybody knows a little bit about your kind of backgrounds, uh, almost like a multicultural background as well. But um, how many countries could you have played for uh, if you if you wanted to? Because I know it's a bit of Scottish, <laughs> Italian, maybe Danish, Irish as well. Like yes, plenty of it, plenty of it. I'm a European kid, <laughs> but uh, no, I could have played for Ireland for uh, by, by my grandfather, who mm. was born in Dublin for Denmark by my grandmother, for Italy by my other grandparents, for France, of course. And, and um, tell me a little bit first maybe about your um, the, the, your grandfather from Dublin. Like, did, did, did you know much about him? Like, you know, did you follow him? Did, you know, did you hear stories about him growing up? And yes, of course. Um, but he was born in Dublin, but arrived in Scotland when he was two. So in fact, uh, I never feel Irish at all. I never feel Danish at all. But I really feel British and Scottish by my father and, mm. and grandparents, and uh, and after of course French and uh, by my by my mother. And does that help maybe in a way you got good English as well? Like you know, like you kind of you know from being around your your, your dad, like you know, kind of spoke a bit growing up as well. Yes, always had the, a bit of this British culture uh, at home, so mm. speaking a bit English with my dad, with uh, all my British family. <laughs> 
and uh, yeah, this helped me a lot uh, for my studies first, and now with uh, with the rugby as well because we've got multicultural uh, locker room, so uh, yeah. I can easily speak with Will Skelton or with all the French guys. So this is great for me as well. Um, Alton Galan had mentioned that when he first came over, he said you brought him out with friends for dinner and stuff like that, and he said that was a really great way of helping him get settled in as well. Like. Um, and then he didn't tell me what his initiation was. He just said that he was well looked after as well. Like, it, it, what do you guys kind of like? Because you've been here um, maybe five, five years, six, six season maybe now. Like, what do you guys do to welcome the new players when they when they arrive to make them feel at home as quick as you can? Well, uh, first of all, when you're French and playing in France, you don't realize the, the sacrifices uh, foreign players do to come in uh, another country mm. uh, far from their family and friends. And um, I realized that when my brother went to both, one went to Australia for six months and another for New Zealand for six months. So they brought me as well this culture of uh, moving. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's why when I knew that uh, Ulti was there uh, in France, arrived I think for two or three days and he was alone, I said uh, like, come with us and uh, have a dinner with us. So this was important for me and um, for the integration. This year was a uh, different year. We uh, we decided to change, so they made just a, a round of uh, of La Rochelle to discover the city and uh, a few pubs of it as well. <laughs> but uh, now really important to to do this uh, more this year than the other year because we had uh, around 12, 12 new arrivals. Mm. So important to uh, to integrate everybody to the group and. Uh, to make one after the after yeah. the preseason. You start off with like, is it? I know my pronunciation will be terrible, but like uh, FC Alk, uh, like your your first club where you first. FC Alger, yes. Uh, how do you pronounce it? F C A G. A G. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, just with them, like, um, did you start with them as a teenager? Like, what was your own kind of journey into getting into kind of rugby proper as well? Well, I started first uh, north of uh, Osh. Yeah. Same department, a little town, mm. which is really funny for all the British uh, because it's named Condon. <laughs> it's north of uh, Gers. And then I went uh, to Osh when I was 10 years old mm. because my parents moved away. Mm. And um, I played over there for 10 years. And in fact, the last two years I was with the first team, it was third division of uh, French rugby. Mm. And uh, from there, uh, Greg Pata was a for, uh, an ex coach of uh, La Rocha. Mm -hmm. um, which was coming from uh, Osh as well, yeah. uh, brought me and uh, Pierre Bougarit in La Rocha. Yeah, yeah. And that's why uh, everything went after. Uh, and then like a, a, a kind of great player like yourself and then Pierre, a really great player as well. Like, but, um, you guys, like your journey is together, isn't it as well? Like, so it's like, um, I was trying to think back to like all of a sudden in Marseille when you guys won and you know, you're looking at each other and it's, it's the you know it's that's not the, the end of the journey, but it's like what a, a major achievement. Like, did you guys look at each other and kind of say, "Is this real?" You know. Yes, yeah, it was really special to win with uh, with a good friend of me and an uh, old friend of me. Um, to play with a French team as well with him. Mm. Just uh, some some moments special, but uh, honestly, we don't have. We don't really have the time to appreciate it and to stay on it. And uh, well, every weekend there is a next uh, a new game, and we need to always think of the next week and the future. But um, I'm sure at the end of the career, of our career, maybe in ten years off, yeah. <laughs> we'll get around a, a good dinner and we'll uh, speak about all the memories we have together and say like, "Whoa, we, we did a great thing." I remember being in in uh, the velodrome when you guys beat Leinster in the final. And Raj was talking about it. We were sitting beside you in the press conference and he spoke about uh, you guys maybe thought he was mad. He was talking about how big Europe was. And can you remember those early talks where he was trying to build everybody up about how you know winning Europe was a possibility? Can you remember those kind of talks where he was trying to get you all motivated to win that big thing? No, oh, clearly, clearly. When you arrive at the first meeting, you say, well, 28th of May, we are winning the Champions Cup. Yeah, okay, okay, Raj. <laughs> Like, uh, let's play the first game and we'll see. And no, he was right. Like, game after game, we, we managed to, to build something and uh, we arrived to the to Marseille. And I think well, the, the past final against Toulouse helped us, uh, helped us uh, a, a lot. But 
we we decided before going to Marseille that we uh, we wanted to win it. Yes. Who's who's got the worst fashion in, in the team? Who's kind of like uh, where's the craziest clothes in the team? Easy, Teddy Toba. Yeah. <laughs> Who pushes the most in the gym? Who moves the most weights in the gym? Who's the strongest? Well, we've got some great challenger with Reda Wardy and George Henri Colomb. Mm. Also them, yeah, very good. And then who kind of might be seen in the gym an awful lot? They're mainly just kind of walking around, you know, flexing, <laughs> not doing too much. If some say me, yeah, don't listen to them. But uh, <laughs> Romain Sazi, of course. Of course. Um, and then I was saying, like, let's say we're talking about most likely to, or like over the course of the season, somebody who's most likely to. So who's most likely to show up late for the team bus or, or a plane? George Henri Colomb. He, he's, he's getting mentioned a few times. Yeah. Right? yeah. <laughs> Too late back. <laughs> um, who's the most likely to pick up the most fines over the course of a season? Um, I see Raymond Rua. Yeah, Raymond. Who is uh, who's made? Who'd make the, the big best speeches in the dressing room? Who'd get everybody going? Uh, well, not so many names uh, because we're uh, yeah well many names I would say. Yeah. We are we are a few uh, a few to, to 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 speak in the locker room, and uh, this can change. It can be Romain, can be Pierre Bougarit, it can be can be me sometimes. It can be Brice Dulin. Try to change. And um, who's got the best singing voice? Who's who's the best singer? Dylan, Dylan Leeds and uh, Pierre Poplet, both of them. And um, I've got to say them as well. Yeah, who's um, Who's the kind of the biggest character? Like you know, the guy who'd walk in the room and everybody would just break into a smile, like when, when they see him walking into the room. Winnie, Winnie Antonio, of course. <laughs> Well, that was an interesting chat with Gregory Aldred. He speaks very well, doesn't he, for a French lad? Yeah, yeah. What is it? Um, yeah, he, he's very good. I was saying I was almost, uh, you know, professional that I am, but I was dazzled by just the, the sheer... Good looks and personality. Just the sheer presence. <laughs> of his, he's got these... Oh, God, I've actually got to get rid of deep in, going, I was going to say start. he's got these amazing brown eyes. Oh, like, yeah, like, yeah. fall in love with Gregory <laughs> yeah. Aldred. A little bit, a little bit. I was saying, yeah, I'd sent, uh, I sent Katrina, my wife, like a, a message, just like, uh, I think I just, I'd recorded it. And I sent her a little screenshot and I was like, I was chatting to this guy. It's like, what do you think? Is this guy, this guy is good looking, isn't he? I'm not, I'm not going crazy. And she was like, oh yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Send me a voice note from him or something like that if you could. Yeah, yeah. Um, Person being married to you. Yeah, but he, um, but yeah, it was funny now. He's, he's well, like he's just, he is the guy, like the captain at that, that club that uh, keeps everything ticking. And I was, I was saying, I was talking for like a season with there that we do with Rugby Joe. I was talking to their S&C coach, Philippe Gardent is, is his name. And he was just talking to him. I said, you know, who's the guy who sets the records in the gym? He's always looking for the gym insights. And he was just saying, um, I'll just give you one name. Gregory Aldrit is, is the guy that sets the tone here. He's the guy who's in the gym. You know, he's oh, the guy yeah. who talks to everybody. He's the kind of, I think even Alton Deland said when he arrived over, Gregory Aldrit was the first guy to get onto him, said, come on out with me and my mates for like dinner one evening. And like, he's kind of, he's the, almost like the, the, the father, you know, mm -hmm. like, and he looks after everybody and he's only still like a young enough lad. Like I think maybe only 26, 27, like, but he, he's kind of comes from like a little small town in France, then moved to there when he was young enough. Him and Pierre uh, Bougerie, the, the hooker mm -hmm. came together, like, and, and they're great friends. And so, yeah, he's, he's just a guy who kind of just knits everything together and, so it is funny, like I thought even before I met him that he should have been up for like World Player of the Year. Because I remember when I said to him, I said, oh, yourself and Josh van der Fleer are probably going to be up for this award. Like, mm -hmm. what do you think of Josh? And and he just spoke so kindly of him and said how great he was. But, he, you know, he was kind of coy about, you know, whether he'd be up for it himself. And I was actually shocked then that he wasn't yeah. like, but. Mm -hmm. One of the omissions were all kind of like, what? Yeah, yeah. Like, but yeah, he's he's just the kind of guy who's, they've got a nice like setup out there. And you can kind of see why Raj you know, it's no bad thing for Rog that he's set up there, you know, yeah. for another few years. And uh, yeah, they, they have a nice little setup. So I'd be interested going to see them now up at King's Band this yeah, weekend. Lovely, yeah. yeah. The series yeah. is great, by the way. Well, oh, done. cheers. Yeah, you're smashing it with that. Thanks very much, Pat, for getting those interviews. To move on with the European Cup, well, the Challenge Cup. Connacht are playing in that and they won 22-8 against Newcastle Falcons in Galway, which is a good win because it was not nice weather in Galway over the weekend. <laughs> is it ever nice weather oh, in Galway? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I <Sorry>. know. <laughs> they have a lovely pitch, but the weather is just chronic. So they won 22-8. Paul Boyle uh, scored. Adam Byrne got his first try for the province. Congrats, Adam. Well done. He had a lovely photo up with a couple of ex-Lenster lads. They all had a nice photo oh, up yeah, in their new yeah. Connacht jerseys. 
Um, and Dear McKill Gallon sealed the win with a late try. I trained with him with the Sevens team. That was cross field kick, wasn't it? Yeah, he is genuinely one of the best athletes I've ever seen. His scores really? in the gym, we were talking about gym scores there. Mm. I thought I was good when it came to like CMJs and stuff. This young fella strolls in from Connacht and just smashes everything <laughs> across the board. And I was like, this lad's going somewhere. And yeah. I fast forward a couple of weeks or a couple of months and he's scoring twice for Connacht in the European Cup. So um, it all makes sense. Absolutely. Um, I've actually, uh, yeah, it's on Kilgallen, like he's another lad like Keane Prendergast. He's from Kildare. Like, and uh, they're all from that little Eads town area where Ty Byrne is from. Like, so I don't know what they're doing out there. something going on out there. Yeah. <laughs> Freaks. Production like, line of yeah, yeah, great athletes, yeah. Yeah, I might have a child and set up out there. <laughs> there <you go. laughs> I love it. Yeah. Getting uh, the bloodline ready. Hmm, let me see. Well, that's it, exactly. Yeah. So you're talking about a lot of love in this podcast, aren't we? <laughs> yes, we, we just love each other. It's, it's a, a good place to come on a Monday. <laughs> we do. Well, you were saying, Connacht, uh, you think they were resting a few fellas on the weekend? Yeah, well, David Hawkshaw played. I think he played 10. He played very well, I thought. Adam Byrne was nice to see him. Uh, Peter Dooley was in there at loose. Obviously, he came from Leinster as well. Uh, Kilgannon, um, it was on the wing. I thought he did very well. Paul Boyle, I thought he was excellent in, in, in the back row. Um, Niall Moore is not... Niall, Niall Murray. Murray, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Keep getting his name wrong. He did another... He did another good game. Um, so I thought, considering who they rested and obviously they were away to Bereave next week, I so thought the performance have Bundy, was they good. didn't have Mac. Nope. Yeah. Uh, they didn't have uh, Jack Carty. I didn't see. Yeah, Jack no Porch. Yeah, no Carty. Yeah. yeah, like um, Jeez, they're missing a lot of fellas. Yeah, yeah so yeah, it's good yeah. performance. All things considered, now and a good win, twenty two eight. I think it was good yeah. stuff. Connacht, and they have Breve up next, who got a spanking off Cardiff, forty one nil. And Cardiff aren't doing too well, so I don't know what's going on with Breve there. Yeah, that's it. Like with the French sides, it's like if they lose one game in Europe, they just be like, screw, <laughs> screw that. Like yeah. we're done with that. Like yeah, just bring in the red the wine. Yeah, get the espoirs in, and we'll just kind of <laughs> chill out for the next one. <laughs> yeah. Like yeah. <laughs> so hopefully that's going to be another win for Connacht, and they can keep making their way up that uh, that cup. Um, we had a tweet from Raj actually about the mm. European Cup. Um, he was mentioning the London Irish versus Mount Pellier game. And he, this is his tweet. He said, must be the first time ever that the opening game of the European Cup is played in a mostly empty stadium. Desperately, desperately sad to see. Did you see that tweet, Lindsay? Yeah, I saw it. And I, I, I kind of felt from, do you know what I mean? You just feel that really sad feeling in your belly. I was like, do you know what? European days are meant for full stadiums and just a bit of crack and the kids are there and it's a big day out, you know? Yeah. And um, it's very sad because, you know, London Irish are a star club, Montpellier the same. Like, you, you, want, you want the best players on show with, in front of fans. And I don't think it's good for the game of rugby to see that, let alone the players playing it, you know. So I was very, very disappointed. Yeah, it's, a, it's a kind of like I was only catching little bits and you'd, you'd see the glimpses over the week, weekend as well. And it was like the, I couldn't even find the official attendance. Like sometimes they always put season ticket holders mm -hmm. in. It's like you've, you're at the game, but you might not be. But you just saw all the photos come from it. And yeah, and like to have like your champ, champ, Champions Cup launch, South African slides are in it this year. Yeah. They had a big, huge launch over in kind of London. Everybody's hyped about it. And then you just tune in and it's just like, or you see clips or you watch photos of it and it's just like empty seats yeah. all over the place. Yeah. Like, so, um, yeah. People it, it are really, wondering what the hype's for then, you know? Yeah, and I saw even there, like, I think the last game to wrap up the weekend was Ospreys against Leicester. Like, and they're like, so the English champions are coming to play Ospreys in Wales. Mm. And they didn't have a full stadium either. Like, and I saw some of the, the journalists saying, listen, I know it's cold. I know it's not like kind of, I know people have Christmas plans at the moment, but like, yeah, like I know it's a Sunday as well. Like, but you still would have thought they'd have came close to kind of mm. selling that out. And, and for all the Welsh guys who always go on about, oh, we need to play English opposition, the, like an Anglo Welsh league, you know, yeah. and all of a sudden you have the English champions coming to your town and nobody's there. It's just kind of, it's, it's a strange look for the competition. And I, I don't know what's going on. Like you can't blame it on the South African sides because no. they're, at least they're bringing some enthusiasm to the competition and mm. they'll be packing out stadiums and, and putting up big players as well. So I don't know, I don't know where, and we're not is there a disconnect? Out of lockdown. Like, yeah. like we're not long out of lockdown. We were like, oh, we need people back in stadiums, like free us. Mm. And now, You've empty stadiums. And the thing is, yeah, grand is Christmas and everything like that. But European fixtures have been out. Tickets have been a long time. You plan your kind of life around these big days, you know. Yeah. Um. So it's kind of strange, very strange. It is. Well, maybe all the people in the UK were getting ready for the France England World Cup quarter final, and they weren't going out watching London <laughs> Irish game. Shout out to France getting a win there, by the way. Thank <laughs> God. Oh my God. Like we all love the, all the memes gone round of Harry Kane oh and, and uh, God. oh God. Yeah. Did you Harry see Kane, the, the video like that did the rounds yesterday? It was like it was from twenty eighteen. Yeah, Johnny Wilkinson. Yeah, yeah. Johnny like Wilkinson teaching how to kick over the, <laughs> yeah. the post. Oh, poor Harry Kane. But like, I couldn't be listening to the English fans. Like, I'm delighted France won. I just had to be honest there. Like, they they were saying it was coming home after their first win against Iran six two. 
That's a grand song. I know. But sure, every time it's broken record. It's now, the same this time, time, isn't it? every time. Like, well, new well, song, look. lads. New post, <laughs> new song. <laughs> well, just to kind of wrap up all the European games there, you mentioned a few of them. London Irish lost uh, 27 32 at, at home to Montpellier. Racing got a bait in 42 10 against Racing. Sharks won 39 31 in their first European game, which is great away to Harlequins. Or at home to Harlequins, yeah, sorry. Matt Pimpy got a, a couple of tries there, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's incredible. It's great to see the South Africans in the European yeah. Cup, isn't it? I think Joe Marler alluded to that. He wasn't looking forward to going away after they beat... Uh, or did they beat Sharks last week in their premiership? So he's like, yeah, big trip away. Yeah, yeah. more <laughs> trips to South Africa. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Gloucester won 22-17 um, against bordeaux Begle. Claremont won 24-14 against the Stormers. And La Rochelle, as we mentioned, won 46-12. And that's it for the for the weekend, wasn't it? Um, yeah, oh no, we had Bulls. Sorry, so we had Bulls playing at home against Leon, forty two thirty six, big scoring game. Yeah, yeah. Um, sorry, Exeter beat Cast uh, twenty seven twelve. It was on in Cast, and Sale won thirty nine nil. Um, and oh, we have a couple of more. Jeez, we've loads of games. Sorry, Sarri's yeah, barely got over the line, yeah. didn't they? Yes. Sarri's won 30 points, 26. That yes, scare. barely over yeah. the line. Against Edinburgh, an Edinburgh team that struggled in the yeah. URC the last couple of weeks. So yeah, I wow. was just expecting that just to, just um, to get buried. Like, yeah. yeah, yeah, but it was close. I can't believe how many games they were on. Munster <laughs> lost, obviously, 13 points to 18 at home to Toulouse. And Leicester won 23-17. And that is all the games. Wow, some amount of rugby, wasn't it, Pat? Yeah, yeah, just like you, the... Just had a little baby there on my shoulder, just trying to take yeah. as much of it in as I could. Like, and <laughs> <laughs> even you couldn't but be watching all those games. Like, yeah, forget about it. Yeah, but the time yeah. it came to Ospreys Leicester, you're like, you know what? I think I'll just yeah. go for a bit of fresh dinner. air here. Yeah, yeah. yeah, we're spoiled for choice. Yeah. But to pick a never stop competing moment out of all those games, we were kind of chatting beforehand. There was a lot of rugby on, so it was tough to pin one down. I suggested it being Leinster because of the travel mm-hmm. woes they had like all over the place and then to go and beat Racing away is just incredible so mm-hmm. we give it to uh, Never Stop Competing Moment to Leinster together with Bank of Ireland well done lads you are just incredible keep it up um, that was definitely a Never Stop Competing yeah and just yeah. Yeah, the whole thing of just keep the head like you know focused yeah. and, and, and on a swivel as well and what a, what a message to send out 10 wins from 10 now and yeah. um just I actually yeah, well I was gonna go back and start talking about the game again, but I was even thinking of the difference like so Alatoa and Jenkins now has made to them as well. Huge, like, yeah. hasn't it? Yeah. Um and I think again it's you know, we we've spoken about the contrast with Munster and having some big names come into them and not really buying in, but Leinster have been very lucky in the the kind of the names that they've brought in outside of their academy and mm. their school setup and they've actually, you know, they've settled in really, really well. Mm. So I'm very yeah. impressed, yeah. Naga, what, how do we pronounce his name? Naga, oh, Charles Nagati. Yeah. Nagati. I thought he had a great game the weekend yeah. as well. I thought he was superb. And Charles another Nagati, guy who's yeah. just come in, just under the radar, just about his business, and it has kind of gone in there seamlessly, hasn't yeah. he? Really? Yeah, he's been a great signing. In fairness, and gets his work done. And uh, just to kind of wrap up a little bit more, rugby was the Cape Town Sevens was on on the weekend. Yeah. The lads didn't do too well, so we won't mention that. But the women did really well, thank they God. Fantastic. They were smashing it all the way through and they ended up finishing fourth. They lost to the eventual winners, New Zealand. Um, they lost 14-7. So well done, girls. Great way to finish off the this calendar year of Sevens and uh, going to 2023 um, on the front foot. Yep, they got a great win against France. I know that they had a great tournament. So, yeah, congratulations yeah. to all. And other than that, guys, we have more European Cup next week. Mm-hmm. Pat, I want to thank you very much for joining us. Yeah, Did you enjoy you. it? Yeah, it was good. Yeah, good to be back. Yeah, it was great having you. I was thinking the last time I was actually on camera for like a house of rugby, uh, except for, you know, the interviews you might do was, I think it was um, in, in the in our studio, our old studio. And I think we had Ian McKinley on. And who we actually, yeah, not spoke to not too, too long ago. But yeah, the, it was in the the midst of COVID because COVID mm. had hit Italy first and we were almost ringing him up to see how it was, it was going and <laughs> yeah. what is like you know he's talking about lockdown and kind of like being in the, the uh, you know the, the place with their little dog and the, you know bringing your dog out for your walk and stuff yeah. like that so it's funny now to think what how much has changed you know since then time, and yeah. how the world has changed as well and um and then, yeah, we just keep popping out babies then as well. I was just like going to say, meantime, more yeah. of a carries on the menu. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it was been great. And you guys are very, very good to me as well. It's, gr- it's great. Uh, it's great to kind of be here and kind of, like, you've made it very easy for me as well. Cause Pat, you know how much we love you. So yeah. It's great to. Well, thanks. Yeah. Yeah. I appreciate all, all the work you do for us, Pat. Thanks a million. And Lindsay, thank you so much as always with your insight. Thank you, honey. Yeah, as always a pleasure <laughs> you're such a cutie <laughs> <laughs> and of course big thank you to Bank of Ireland our partners and proud supporters of the four Irish provinces we'll see you next weekend guys for another week of European Cup talk to you then 
Joe presents House of Rugby, together with Bank of Ireland, proud supporter of the four Irish provinces.